Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse beginning at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Now, how many of you brought at least uh, three visitors tonight that are not members of this church? Let's see your hand. If you brought three or more. One hand back there. Let's see how many did you bring? Seven. And if I bring more than seven, how many did you bring? You bought seven? I have to tear a picture in half. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, I guess we'll give one. That's why I don't usually give the picture away. Uh, the night I draw it, but wait for the next night, so in case there's a tie, there's an extra picture to go there. So we'll give the uh, young lady the picture I did this morning, and we'll give the man back there the picture I'm going to do tonight. And I'm going to do the picture tonight on the whole armor of God. Now, let me say this, uh, how much I've enjoyed being with you all this uh, this week. I've had me a real refreshing up here. It's a, it's a blessing to preach to folks that respond once in a while. And uh, I guess you've got your problems like anybody else, but at least you're open to the truth. <laughs> and that's a blessing. Now, like I said, when I first got saved, I began to preach up in this part of the country out west of here. And when I got there to preach, there were bootleggers outside throwing the beer can on top of the church and laughing during the invitation and drinking whiskey out in front of the barn, all this and that. And it was pretty rough indoctrination in the ministry, but I guess I probably needed it. And uh, I left these mountains here back in 1953, and all my meetings from 1953 until last year were down any place in the world except Carolina. And then last year I got a meeting in uh, near Spartanburg, South Carolina, with a fellow named Monroe from Florence, South Carolina. Big church, big youth camp. And preached with him that year, and then I'm back with him this year. And so this first time I've been up this way for a good while, and I like your style, man. I like your style. I like it. I get near these mountains, I feel something just saying, just come on back in a little bit further, a little bit deeper. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's uh, I guess good, but it's kind of bad, too. I'm not, uh, I don't know how I feel about going back down the lowlands again after being up here. And you all pray for me now. Get Lord, give me some grace. <laughs> and take your Bible now and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll begin to verse 10. In this passage here, it's a military passage, and Paul's talking about the military. Now, there are many things in this life I know nothing about, like I told you, when it comes to things like physics and carpentry and mechanics and gasoline motors and electronics and astronomy and banking, that kind of stuff. I don't know a thing in this world, and I leave those things up to the people that know how to do it, and I leave them alone. But uh, there's something in this world I've had some experience with and fool with, and one of them is the military. I come from a long line of military people, all my people are professionals. Uh, the only reason I'm not a professional is when I was in the Army of Occupation in Japan after World War II. I got there in the Daiichi building with MacArthur and Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Tse and Sigmund Rhee and all that bunch. And I got to sit up there in my combat boots and my infantry clothes watching those fellows. And a great disgust came across me. And I said to myself, you know, some of us infantry men were just a bunch of pawns. We're the ones who get shot at. That bunch up there, they call the shots, and they get out high and dry. And I didn't re-up. And that was back in 1947. I came home. Good thing I came home. The Korean War broke out. If I'd have stayed in, I'd been in Korea and got shot and been in hell. And I came back to the States, and two years later, I got saved. But all my people were military people. My grandfather was a general. My great-grandfather was a general, West Pointers. My daddy was a sergeant. Uh, my daddy was a captain in World War I, a colonel in World War II. My brother was a sergeant. My brother was a sergeant, and I was a shave tail, second lieutenant. All of them were riflemen. And when I read through the Bible, I find these figures of the military through the Bible. I'm on home ground. Now, this figure you're reading about right here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, is a description of a first century infantry soldier. And the passage says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wile of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, he says, uh, Take you the whole armor of God, that you may stand, and having done all, stand. Then he says, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, Take in the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He says in that passage, Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying with all prayer and supplication, and so forth and so on. 
Now, coming down to that passage in 10, 11, 12, and 13, he's describing the equipment of a first century Roman soldier. I don't know if you ever noticed how many times or not in the Bible that military figure occurs, but it's found in the Bible many, many times. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Therefore, my son, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him with chosen him to be a soldier. Uh, when Paul got through with his life, you know what he said? He said, I fought a good fight. It's a battle, you see. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, I read that Jesus Christ is the captain of my salvation. Captain. We call him, in rifle company, we call him the old man. Now, if you went by the average church today, would you think it was an armed camp ready to do business for God? Did you know something's happened to American Christianity in the last 30 or 40 years? And the, the thing that's gone is it's lost its military flavor, it's lost its aggressiveness. If you went by the average church in Charlotte or Greensboro, would you think it was a military camp doing business for God? I mean, you might think it was a civil war. Or you might think it was a big nursery, you know, or an old folks' home, take care of folks that are half sick and about half asleep. But would you think it was an encampment ready to do battle for God? That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an encampment. Now, the army of 1977 is not the army of 1937 and 27. And I don't know much about the army nowadays. I've been out of circulation. I don't know what the T.O. and T.E. is anymore in the rifle company. And I'm not too sure about everything in it. But when I went in back there in 1938, they had wood stoves. And they had a wraparound putty legging, the spring through 30 or 6 rifle. And K.P. in the morning was from 5 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. That's, that, that stove didn't cool down. You couldn't clean the thing out till 8 o'clock at night. The army I went into had MPs in it. They were all over six feet tall. They were all Swedes. They all had loaded forty-fives, and they were told to fire once at your feet and the next time in your belly. <laughs> and the army I went into had discipline. Uh, I feel sorry for young men getting in the army these days. They're getting in a, getting in a rat's nest. You can't make a man obey an order. I saw a picture in Time magazine the other day of a lieutenant returning a salute going down the street in Berlin, West Berlin, and two colored guys are going by and I'm giving him this for a salute. You know what that salute is there? That's the official salute of the Communist Party. You dumb people watch television, you think that means black power. You never meant black power a day in your life. You get new real pictures of Earl Browder and the Communist Party in 1935, they got that thing just like that. You get pictures of the strikers in 1933 and 1934 in New York with the Cossack caps and their boots and their red flag, and it's just like that. You get a picture of that Communist Party in Spain, the Spanish Revolution, and it's just like that. You take a bunch of dumb suckers watching television, they don't know what in the world is going on, man. That ain't no black power, man. That's the official suit of the Communist Party, man. Ain't you got any sense? Let me tell you something. The army, if I was in, if I threw a salute at a couple of guys like that and they gave you that, in the army I was in, you'd take that forty-five and turn around and say, Halt! And if they didn't stop, you'd put one at their feet and the other one on the back. And then you'd tell them they got killed in training accidentally. <laughs> and that'd be the end of it. That'd be the end of it. There was no IG to go to or nothing. Uh, the, the, the army, it, it's not like what it used to be by any means. Uh, you take that arm I was in with a guy just when he messed up, boy, those MPs sometimes would beat him to death with clubs, man. Some mom a little note home said he fell off the back of a two and a half ton truck. I remember the first day I got in, I thought I was going to, you know, be a big shot. Boy, I got wise real quick, man. I learned the score real quick in that outfit, boy. One of my friends wasn't so wise, and he got in bed the first morning, they blew Reveille, and they, and they told him to fall out, and he said, you come up and make me. <laughs> he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and boy, the next thing you know, two MPs about six feet five came up there with those grub handles I had, and those 45 said, soldier, you going to hit the deck? He said, you make me. They did. They liked to kill him. They liked to kill him. And back in those days, there wasn't anybody to complain to. It's a different kind of thing than it is now. Now, I've often thought, what would happen if you trained Christians like you trained soldiers? Well, that'd be something. I mean, Christians always whine and complain and gripe and belly aching all the time. That's what soldiers do, too. But they still take orders. God's people won't even take orders. You know, if you yelled at the average congregation like they yelled at the average GI in the army I was in, you wouldn't have any members left. Can't you see a guy in the army come in and say, Captain, I'm not going on the, mar on the march today. Oh, you're not. 
I said, my old man say, he'd say, oh, you're not. <laughs> no, sir. You've been yelling at me, and I don't like your tone of voice. <laughs> you know what he'd say to you? I couldn't say it. I'm saved. <laughs> Imagine come down there and say, Sergeant, I'm not going out and drill today. Oh, you ain't. No, I'm not. Why ain't you? Well, so-and-so been standing next to me in ranks. They've been saying things about me I don't like, and I'm just not going out with him today. <laughs> you know what he'd do to you, brother? He'd take your hide off and put it up against the wall and assault it. In fact, I went in the deep freeze. He wouldn't get out for six months. My old top sergeant was a fellow named Zirkel. I've seen him stand up against the GI and cuss him out and call him everything but white. And when that GI called, his hand got red in the face and said, You just say that because you got those stripes. Oh, Zirkel, take that shirt off and put it down. Take him around behind the barracks house and barracks and turn him every, every way but loose, boy. Now, you can't do that anymore. I mean, you're picking on the minority, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the army I was in, nobody was a minority. Boy, they were all a majority. <laughs> and they got the tar knocked out of them. Uh, can, can you imagine? A fellow said one time, he said, the reason why you can't get a choir to sing all the Christian soldiers is you got too many conscientious objectors in the choir. <laughs> they don't want to fight. They don't want to fight. The old songs had a military flavor to them. The Son of God goes forth to war, his kingly crown to gain, his blood-red banner streams afar, who follows in his train. Now they got these little kind of rinky-dinky kind of cocktail lounge types of songs. When, uh, when, uh, DeHaan, M.R. DeHaan, old man DeHaan used to come on the radio, he'd come on there with a quartet, you know, singing, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, then he died. And Richard takes it over, and when he comes on, you hear the strings playing. Ain't it nice? <laughs> Ain't it sweet? You know what's going out of American Christianity? There's a military flavor that's going out. The old hymns were sung to a march temple. You don't find many Christian marches anymore. God's people aren't doing much marching. Now, you take that, that army, uh, and you, do, you take that equipment. I used to often wonder about it. I, I said to myself one time, I said, I wonder what it is. I got watching old Dr. DeHaan preach, and got listening to Bob Jones Sr., the old man. Got watching him preach, and got listening to Jane McGinley, and those old fellows who were born back there in the 19th century, those holdovers, you know, Mordecai Ham, that bunch, from 1895 and 1880 and 1885. And I got watching those fellows, and I said, now, you know those old fellows, they got something this young bunch of preachers just doesn't have. And you couldn't put your hand on it. It wasn't that they were better preachers. It's just something. They just had something. You couldn't describe it. And one day I got thinking about that, and I said, Lord, what is it? What in the world is it about those old timers they got that my generation doesn't have and the next generation doesn't have? And the Lord said to me, he said, well, how do you make a good soldier, Pete? I said, you persecute them. You persecute them. I was a DI for four years in the infantry, and the way you get a good soldier, you persecute him. You say, you want that water in that canteen? Screw the top on, bud, and pour it down his pants. You say, you want that button soldier? Yank it off his shirt, a hand to him, say, so it off. Say, suck it, you got. Bot, go by and hit him in the stomach. They're court martial Marines for hitting the guy in the stomach. How are you going to teach a guy to suck his gut in unless you hit him in the stomach? <laughs> suck in your belly, bud. You hit him when go on down the, you persecute him. You get out there and say, come on, man, come on, get that bat and stick me, stick me, stick me. Oh, mama's little baby, mama's little girl scout, can't stick anybody. Come on, stick me like that. You irritate him, you aggravate him, you kick him. <laughs> did you ever did you ever run down a road in 110 degrees with a gas mask on? <laughs> oh, if you've missed that, you've missed a great blessing in life. <laughs> you get running down that old those old Georgia red dirt roads in July, man, that gas mask on and and strafe an attack coming down across you and double timing down that road. And when you get double timing down that road with sixty eight pounds on your back, you want to go <laughs> And you can't breathe that way, because <laughs> that gas mask has a, di has a diaphragm in it, and it won't open and close that quick. You have to breathe, <sighs> and you run along that thing, that sweat is running out inside that mask and up over your lips, you almost drown your own sweat, and you can't take it off, you're going, <clears throat> <clears throat> running down there. I was up there in the stand one time out at Fort Benning, I saw part of a letter some mom had written to her boy in camp. And it said, Dear Sonny, <laughs> you know, some well-meaning mother, bless her heart. <laughs> it said, Dear Sonny, please don't get overheated. <laughs> I thought to myself, boy, if you could see Sonny now, man, if you could see Sonny now. <laughs> Listen, brother, we take him out there, and boy, we drill him till they drop, man. I drilled many managers fell flat in his face, boy. I mean, I just did under as they did under me. 
Our old, our old T.I. was a German named Bronkhorst. He was 50 years old and 5 feet 8 and about 190 pounds. Never heard him curse. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke and he was a black belt. Back in the day when only about 10 white men in the world had him. That old ward stamped that old bandit like that. He'd say, come to the guard position. Hop! Get you out there. You get out in that old field that's bending 110 degrees in the shade, man. He gets you out in that long thrust and get that rifle out like that. And you're holding that rifle out there in your arm like that. You got 12 pounds up in the air and you make you point that bayonet up. You begin to drop. He'd say, hop! You put that thing up. Begin to drop. You say, listen, brother, I've been out there many days stretch out like that when that field was just going like that. That field was just going, <laughs> everything just black out there, little old spots going, bing, bing, bing. I said, I said, hold still, hold still, hold still. <laughs> Try until I feel the hold still and just go, <laughs> <laughs> about that time you hear a guy go, blap the side of you, blop the side of you, fall over there, drill him. Why, if some of you Christians had to go out in these mountains, walk around here for an hour and pass out tracks, you'd faint. I never could understand why an unsaved man will do more for the devil than a Christian will do for the Lord. I never understand it. I'll tell you something about those old fellows I was raised with. They may have been godless, and they were, and they've been a bunch of dirty, low-down dogs, and they were, and most of them are dead in hell, and they are. But I'll say one thing for them. They had a, they had a backbone that I wish God Almighty would cut out of them and put to some of you. I have never gotten used to Christians. I've been saved 28 years. I'm not used to them yet. You get up here to preach, and they look at your cufflinks. They look at your shoe polish. They look at your fingernails. Christians are weird, man. They're weird. You know, if I knew about Christians what I know right now, I'd have probably never gotten saved. <laughs> it's a good thing when I got saved, I didn't know nothing about Christians. Oh, we train them, brother. Now, let me tell you, we train them. I'd get them out there. Did you ever see a bayonet drill? I, when I first got saved, the thing that impressed me about old man Bob Jones Sr. was that his preaching was the nearest thing to a bayonet drill I'd ever seen. You get a fellow out there and you get him to Springfield, the long bayonet, that's the one you usually train him with. Marines have him turn him to the side, which is a better way. You, the guy gets cut trying to take it away from you. And you take that thing out there and you get him out like that, and you, and those movements are like this. You get the fellow back here and you get him this, this bayonet, you put him on guard, and you give him a short thrust, goes here. You give him a long thrust, it goes here. You give him a bird of bus stroke, it goes here. You give him a smash in the face, it goes here. You cut him across the throat, it goes there. Never one of those movements is just pow, 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 pow like that. There isn't one of those movements that's backward. Every one of those movements is forward. And if you're like this and the guy's behind you, you don't even step back to step into him. If he's behind you, you take one step forward and pull that thing up to guard and come down this way so when you face him, the thing is cross you covering you. Even a turn in a bayonet drill is forward. You didn't know that was scripture, did you? Paul said, I forget those things that are behind, listen, and press forward for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, if God Almighty just takes some of you Christians and teach you that, you'd know more than you know right now. You say, I made a mess of my past. Okay, brother, let's go forward. You say, well, I wish I could go back and fix it. You can't. You say, well, I wish I'd never done it. I know that, but it's done. You say, well, if it's just some way to repair it, you just make a mess trying to repair it. Now it's gone, it's dead, forget it, forward. <laughs> See? Now you take those guys in the army, they had more sense about that thing than some Christians. Some Christians are always going back there and messing around, licking the wounds and licking the chops over the past and messing around with that thing. Drop it, brother, drop it, let's go forward. I just get up on that training, brother, let me tell you, I train them, they drop. I've been over the Philippine Islands, I've taken a five-gallon can of water many a time back here in the jungles of Bataan and Corregidor. Cutting bamboo. Did you ever cut bamboo over there in Manila, up in the mountains? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a gas or two, brother. <laughs> you take off your shirt and it, they prickle you and stick you to death. You put on your shirt and you sweat to death. And those Filipinos kept sneaking back and stealing water out of that water can. I'd take that five gallon water can and sit that thing up there and say, I'll catch one of you birds coming back in. I'm going to kick that thing over in the ground. And they'd sneak, sneak back and steal it, you know. And I'd set that thing up and kick that thing over and run down there. Those old boys watch that water down, going down the ground, boy, looking their chops. Had to work up there three more hours with no water. You see what a mean way to treat folks. That's how you make a good soldier. You persecute him. You persecute him. I was out there training those fellows one day in a bayonet drill out north of Manila someplace, one of those training areas, and there was one old boy there, he kept dropping his bayonet, dropping his bayonet. I said, now you drop that thing one more time, you double time up the road. I make him hold a rifle over the head like this and double time up the road, about a quarter mile up and a quarter mile back. Quit show. 
with boots on and 115 degrees isn't exactly, you know, a holiday sport. <laughs> and uh, this old boy was out there, and he had that old rifle out like that, pretty much nothing in a drop. I said, get him up, get him up. He said, but, Lieutenant, I'm very, very sick. I said, you got your slip from the medics? No, up. <laughs> a couple minutes later, he begins to drop that thing. I said, okay, bud, take off. My boy picked that rifle up and began to run down that road. He ran down that road about 100 yards. And then he just fell flat in his face in that road. Boy, just blah, like that. My old rifle went out of heaven in the dirt. All those troops back there standing back there with the rifles out, they turn around looking <laughs> like that, you know. <laughs> and I said, you see that? Good man, worth more money. Well, he fell in his face. Get him up! <laughs> you didn't know that was a Bible either, did you? You know what the Bible said about Jesus Christ in Gethsemane? He went a little further and fell on his face. Any of you ever been long there? Some of you folks trying to whip sin in your own life and get prayers answered. Do you know what you actually need to do if the truth were known? Some of you need to get home and get shut yourself up in a room someplace and get your face down the tongue and groove flat in your face and stay in your face. You have the victory. Right. He went a little further and fell on his face. That's good military training, brother. That Bible says endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The old song says, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb, and should I... Feared only his cause, or blush to speak his name. Must I be carried to the skies and flowery beds of ease? Father has fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure I must fight if I must win. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll stand the pain and do the strife supported by thy word. I'm a recruiter tonight. I want to get some of you to re-up. And I want some enlistments. And like the Marine says, we're looking for a few good men. <laughs> you ever see how they train them? I never forgot when I first got in. You talk about a shock, man. I got in there. I remember about the first, second week I was in there, I got an ingrown toenail. It was a bad one. It turned black and blue, you know, and bleeding around the corner. And I went down to the dispensary and came to get that thing fixed, stood out in line a couple hours, and finally got in there, and some big old PFC from western Kansas said, what's the matter with you? I, I said, I got an ingrown toenail. He said, put her up here. I pulled it up. Took off that sock, took one look at it. That bird reached over and took a pair of scissors. But that long, took the small blade and put it under that toenail and ran it all the way down the root and clipped and took a pair of forceps, took half the nail and yanked it out and wrapped a bandage around it and said, Next. <laughs> Man, my face was as white as that wall. I thought to myself, Next. <laughs> I started there going, Ugh. Brother, I'll tell you, that's the closest I ever came to screaming in my life, man. A guy says, Next. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm sure I was, a, I, was a, I was a real sad sack, man. I remember my old sergeant came with me one day he glowered down at me from somewhere about six feet, three or four, and he said, Why, you little squirt? He picked up his hands right around my ears like this, and he ran his hands down along some of my body this way, and he said, I'll take you by your ears and peel you right down. <laughs> Boy, and he ran his hands, I just feel my skin going, Shh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it must have been about the third or fourth month I was in that army. I had to do KP and got in KP and on KP duty. When I got on KP duty... Well, I was making a salad. Did you ever make a salad for 200 men? That's a mess of tomatoes, man. And I was sitting there cutting those tomatoes up and getting kind of tired, you know, and trying to figure a quicker way to do it. I had me a razor-sharp stainless steel knife, and I finally got that thing done down to a science, man, where I was just going like this, you know, and getting each one about a, you know, about eighth of an inch. And I got my mind on something else and came down, whoop, <coughs> and went halfway through that finger, man. I mean, I felt the knife come on the bone, and that blood just went, Whoosh, all of that salad. And that old mess started and said, Are you blank and you blank? You don't even want at me. And I ducked and got out. I mean, those days you just had to duck and you get hit, man. There wasn't anybody to report anybody to. You go down and report, they say, Your fault for getting hit. Should have ducked. And so I ducked and I grabbed that old bloody stump and started out the, the hall there, heading for the, the dispensary. And going out the door, dripping blood all over the place, I looked back and I saw the old sergeant looking down that salad. And he picked up a bottle of ketchup and put it in there and went, <laughs> stood up. Sure. Sure. <laughs> right, brother. They ate it. They ate it. 
Well, listen, brother, the army I was in, nobody complained about the food. <laughs> Guy come along down there, you know, and he'd say, well, don't I have a choice? The sergeant would say, sure, you got a choice. You can take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> we're out there. We're out there and prayed one day. We've been at present arms for a good while. I was standing up like this, present arms, having a rifle up there. Man, that thing was long as I was. You ever seen a 30 or 6 Springfield? Got a bannet, yay long, you know, an old-time bannet. I think it was up like that. I was standing there like that, attention. And the band was going down the field and back the field, down the field and back of the field. Going down. I, I'd almost quit sweat. After a while you quit, you just go like a stoplight. And I was standing there and a fly got my nose. And I was going. That old sergeant behind me says, at ease. When the band had stood, that fly got my nose again. I was going. That sergeant behind me says, Harry! About that time, the guy ahead of me, he's an arm length ahead and rank, the guy ahead of me begins to go like this. <laughs> that sergeant says, Harry! Didn't pay a bit of attention to him. <laughs> he's out cold, man, out like a light. He's just going like this, and put us in, right in front of me, and he put us in, he goes, <laughs> back like that. And I stepped aside, bam, he landed right by my feet. I remember looking down at that fellow, and he was chomping on his tongue, you know, foam with the mouth, eyes rolling back in his head. About that time, they come right shoulder arms, march out, and they're going, da da pum da 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 pum da da flat da 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 flat da 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 flat da 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 flat, flat, flat. Man, they had the ambulance go around there, pick him up, man, 15 of them lying out there. I'll tell you, brother, if you dropped a rifle outside that building right now, I'd know the sound of it. A rifle in a sling hitting the ground has a certain sound to it. You could tell it anywhere. I could tell it hurt in the middle of the night. You say, what a terrible way to treat our poor little boys. That's how you make a good soldier. We had the greatest army we ever had. In 1944 and 45, we had the greatest army the world's ever seen. And we never had another one since. Let down the bars, let down the standards, let down the discipline. You don't have any army. You let down the bars, let down the standards just from the church. You don't have any soldiers. Now you take this soldier. He got the helmet of salvation on. You can't do nothing in the battle unless you're saved. If you're not saved, you're whipped before you ever start. The silliest fellow you've met in your life is a man that thinks he's going to step in there and win a battle against the devil when he's not saved. Every combat soldier in this world has a helmet of some kind. Even the fellows on board the ships and the plane and the rockets have helmets. And my text says, take the helmet of salvation. All right, then, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is, a, is an offensive weapon. That's for the attack. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The defensive weapon is a shield. That's the shield of faith. All combat has an element of defense and offense. Even in karate, you have your strikes, you have your blows, but even in karate, you have your, you have your guards, your blocks, and those things. In uh, boxing, my thought is leading out here. When he's fighting out here, he's covering here. And if he's uppercutting here, he's covered in here. That's defense and offense. All combat has that element. A fellow's messed around with a knife a long time will never come at you with a knife out here. It's too easy to kick it. He'll take that knife and put it behind him here, and then engage you here. And when he gets you engaged here, then cut in here. Or he'll take that knife and take that knife and Indian hold it in here. And then he'll hold it back in here and bend over this way and keep the knife back here. But there's defense here and there's offense here. Now, every Christian should be a defensive fighter and an offensive fighter. Most Christian people can protect themselves from the devil, and they have faith in God, and they believe God, and they can stand there and take a beating morning, noon, and night, but they never get in a lick for the Lord. Now, you can't fight for God unless you know your weapon. And the first thing you do with the instrument is teach him the weapon, disassemble it. We had to disassemble a BAR that has 21 working parts for the mechanism, any one of us had to take down a machine gun at night, and to do it, they put they put a blindfold on you. They blindfold you, make you feel, strip that machine gun, put it back together again, not ever seeing apart. Now listen, if an unsaved man gets that much training for a weapon, how come you saved people don't know your weapon any better than you know it? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You ought to get in a lick for the Lord. All right, then, loin, girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Did you notice in this passage you just read here that there was no equipment for the back? Did you notice that in that passage? 
Look at that armament right there, and you won't find one reference to any back armor. There is no God that make any allowances for a coward turning and fleeing in combat. I'll tell you something else. If there's no armor in the back, the further you get out in front of your own troops, the more you're going to get shot in the back by your own troops. You ever figure that out? I mean, if a man is number one and two scout, and you walk an ex ambush, part of the fire you're going to get is going to be from your own people. Man's out there beyond the line of departure and reconnaissance, he'll get a short round, will come in and hit him from his own cannons. And when a Christian is way out, ahead of the troops, doing mothers for God, most of the shots he gets are from other Christians. Amen, 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 and amen. And there's no allowance in this Bible, Bible for a coward. In this battle, he says, be strong, be of a good courage. Have not I commanded thee? Fear not. Go on attack. Uh, there's no allowance for a coward. You said, Brother Luck, when I'm scared, it's all right to be scared. Just go ahead anyway. A brave man is not a man who's not afraid. A brave man is a man who's afraid and goes ahead. You never met a man in combat in your life who wasn't scared half out of his wits. Unless he was crazy or on dope. <laughs> Any man that he sends to scare the fire out of you, man. Then he, did any of you ever get caught in an electrical storm out here in the mountains? You ever get caught with you ever get them caught with these things where about 15 bulls came down within about 100 yards of you real quick? Do you notice how real humble and sweet you got all of a sudden? <laughs> you know what that's like? That's just a small imitation of an ox. Praying ground. You get on praying ground. They hate the atheists out there saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, you know, <laughs> just like they thought they knew him. The Lord hears a lot of strange voices in an artillery barrage. You know? Now you take that thing right there, a fellow says, Courage is armor a blind man wears. The callous scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. That's something worth knowing, brother. Courage is armor a blind man wears. The callous scar of outlived despairs. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. Why, why if you know everything that's going to happen in the future, it probably scare you stiff. And thank God the Lord just covered up so you don't have to know what's going to happen. I heard of a general one time back in the old days, back in the days when the general was rode in the troop, rode in the battle with the troops and all the field marshals. And he was about to get in his horse, and one of his under officers said, look at your knees, general. And he looked down on his knees and he said, if you knew where I was taking you, you'd shake worse than that. Now that's the thing to do is to go on when you're scared. You know what every Christian here at this Baptist church should do at least once before you die? You ought to go to the richest, biggest home on Airy, Mount Airy or White Plains, where the uppity ups are, and go up there and bang on that door and tell them where you're from and ask them if they're saved. You say, I'm afraid to do it. You ought to do it just to put some manhood in you, brother. I mean, the way to get, the way to, listen, the way to be a man is act like one. Just act like one to you are one. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't learn how to swim unless you jump in. You can't learn how to drive a car unless you start. The way to learn how to be a man is start acting like one until you are one. Pretty soon you'll be one. That's the way to do the business. I mean, the Lord doesn't want a coward, a person who will turn and flee in combat. We have all kinds of things about that. You take, my dad was a captain in World War I, and he said one night up there near the front lines, they came up there and they, they're going to be a big German push the next day, and they read about a big German drive coming off. And they put a whole bunch of colored troops up there on the front line, and they put 10,000 white troops in behind them to make them sure they'd stay. <laughs> and he said that night up there on the front lines, a couple of those colored boys looking out across that parapet at night. And you know, Ham's all right when it comes to a knife fight or razor fight or back in the alley, but his idea of fun is not at nighttime with those star shells going... There's some old blue-eyed German out there in the dark waiting to get him. That ain't his idea of a good time. And those old colored boys got looking over there, and one of them said, uh, he said, what you suppose uh, the newspaper's going to read this? Suppose, uh, the newspaper's going to read this tomorrow morning after this here battle? <laughs> and the major said, well, man, I don't know about you, but if you feel like I do, it's going to say 10,000 white troops trampled to death. <laughs> <laughs> and, brother, it was. It was. Back there in Iwo Jima and Okinawa and Amy Weetok, one of those hell holes back in World War II, they found an old colored boy about two miles behind the regimental bivouac, and they said, what are you doing, man? He said, I heard them talking bombs, I heard them talking bombs, I heard that bomb said. Well, they don't talk, but they put whistlers on them, you know, and things that demoralize you. You know, they gum. 
the sh uh, mortar goes like that. The big ones, they go like that. The big ones sound like a train coming over. And sometimes a stabilizer drop off. And they drop those things and you hear it coming and goes. <laughs> the Germans have one called a screaming meme. You talk about demoralizing thing, man, just like a woman screaming. You ought to try to go to bed at night about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning out in the mud in the rain, about every 15 minutes. <laughs> I'll tell you, give you a nervous disorder, man. <laughs> and you take, uh, you take, they found old color boy back and he said, I heard that bomb said, I heard that bomb said. And they said, man, that bomb didn't say nothing. He said, yes, it did. And they said, what did it say? He said, that bomb said, boy, you ain't never going back to Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what he says about this thing? He says you ought to have the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That means wherever your feet go, be prepared to preach the gospel. Don't get any place you can't preach the gospel. If you're in an airplane, that guy says, Mayday, Mayday, is there a minister aboard? You raise your hand and say, Me. <laughs> and go up there in the microphone and tell him how to get saved before it hits. Now, when the Titanic went down and sank down, 300 and, uh, well, something like more than that, somewhere around 3,000 people went down, and only about 300 of them got out alive. There was a man out there that got rescued that said he got saved out there in the water through the witness of a man who drowned. That fellow who drowned was a fellow named Harper, coming from Scotland to a Moody Bible conference. And when that fellow was drowning and screaming out there, he said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Harper bobbed up right next to him and said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and then drown. <laughs> and they picked that guy up, and the last thing Harper ever did before he drowned was win somebody to Jesus Christ. His feet were shod to preach it in the icy waters of the Atlantic at 3 o'clock in the morning. you gotta, you got to admit that's being pretty well prepared. All right, feet shod for the preparation of the gospel of peace. And like I said, you ought to see how they train them, brother. They train them. I don't, I don't know how the new army is. I get reports from time to time about some pretty good training they have, but the pretty good training they have is mainly in volunteer outfits. The army, per se, right now is about 40% colored. Now they're trying to get white women in. Two and two is four, boy. Can you imagine what happens when an army full of white women and colored men meet the red Chinese? Do you know very much about Orientals? My, my, man. Boy, you talk about Katie bar the door, man. Listen, those Chinese, if they ever get over here, you know what they do with your babies? They'll take your babies and grab them by the hind leg and throw them up there and catch them on a bayonet. I've seen pictures of them doing it. You saw they wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, they would. they take everything you got in your house and rape your wife right in front of you just quick and look at you. You know, playing ping pong, getting along with the folks. This country is in trouble, people. All right, now the Christian soldier has three enemies. He has the world, he has the flesh, he has the devil. Now the first enemy I have, the most subtle, and that's this little gentleman right here, and this is the world. And he looks like a pretty harmless fellow. He don't have any armor. He doesn't have any big old sword. Of course, he's got a frog sticker behind his back. You take a little fellow like that, you'd think he was perfectly harmless, you know. He comes at you with a dollar bill in this hand and says, you got to make a living. you got to make a living. you got to make a living. Paul calls this the rudiments of this world. You know what the rudiments of this world are? The rudiments of this world are the standards this world goes by. This world has certain standards it goes by, and we might call it the world's Bible. I'll tell you what they are. This world says, we always have done it. Everybody else does it. They ain't no harm in it. My conscience don't convict me. Depending on how you look at it, you've got to get married, you've got to make a living. That's the rudiments of this world. And if I were the devil and I wanted to damn your soul, I wouldn't care if you were a lawyer or a doctor or a senator or a hippie or a junkie or a ditch digger or a freshman or a PFC in the rear rank. If I wanted to damn you, I'd give you one of those. And it worked just good at one of you, it's working any of you, and it worked just good at all of you as any one of you. You've got to make a living. You've got to get married. Everybody else does it. We always have done it. Depends upon how you look at it. But conscience doesn't hurt me. See, that's the world. One time a young lady got up and she gave a brilliant testimony. 
and she'd forsaken a movie career to follow the Lord. She gave a wonderful testimony, a youth banquet. And when she got through, another young lady came up to her and said, you know something? She said, I would just have given the world to have a testimony like you have. And the young, young lady said, you know something? She said, that's just what it cost me. That's just what it cost me. That Bible says, love not the world, neither the things in the world, but all the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but the world, and the world with the lust thereof passeth away, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Here the second enemy. This enemy is the flesh. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. The Bible doesn't say, flee the devil. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. When it comes to the devil, the Bible says, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But when it comes to youthful lust, the Bible says, flee youthful lust. Don't stick out your neck. Don't take extra chances. I know how the world looks at it. You get talking about chastity and purity and people these days giggle and punch each other because they're so dirty they think you're talking dirty. But let me tell you something. The man that Bible God had his stamp of approval upon ran from sin. The woman tried to get a hold of him. He fled and left the garment in her hand. And that Bible said, flee youthful lust, brother. You better be a live coward along those lines than a dead hero. You know what happens? You get messing around with sin. You'll say, well, you go around the devil knock at his door after you get saved, and you'll say, now, devil, I just came by to hear so I'm going to have no more truck with you at all. I'm all through with you. You and me are finished. We're on the outs. The devil said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I guess you've probably done the right thing. <laughs> and you'll say, that's right. I'm going to have nothing more to do to you, so just don't look me up. I'm not going to be around. I just came by and tell you so. The devil said, well, I'm glad you've finally taken the straight and narrow way, and I appreciate it my tries to do right. Why don't you come in and tell me about it? And if you're not careful, you'll have to go in and sit down for coffee. If you're not too careful, you might stay all night. That Bible says, flee you for us. You don't take a chance for those kind of things. You run from them. All right, the Christian is up against the world. He's up against the flesh. He's up against the devil. Now, by far, the greatest adversary the Christian soldier has is the devil. Bible said, be, Bible said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, which are in the world. The Bible says the devil goes about as a roaring lion. I'll tell you right now, he's most dangerous when he comes to you as a nice pussycat. <laughs> I mean, anybody recognize a roaring lion? But the roaring lion is true is his true nature. I heard a preacher say one time, and I'm sure he was speaking evangelistically, at least I hope he was. He said, why, we ought to be bold and brave and charge hell with a squirt gun and tie a knot in the devil's tail. Brother, you're not about, you're not about to tie any knot in the devil's tail. That Bible said, upon the earth there is not made his like who was without fear. Listen, that, that being is so powerful that Michael the archangel couldn't rebuke him. That being is so powerful that back in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ couldn't rebuke him. And in Zechariah chapter 3, the Lord said to the devil, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Is not this a brand plucked from the burning? Jesus Christ couldn't rebuke him, though Jesus Christ came in the flesh and met him on ground as a man. One time I asked an old saint one time, I said, How long have you been bedridden? She said, Oh, I've been bedridden for years and years and years. And she said, I've been flat on my back now about 30 years. And they said, doesn't the devil ever come to you and tell you that God is mean and God is nasty and what a mean old God God is? She said, oh, yes. Yeah, he does that. And they said, well, how do you handle it? And she said, well, I used to argue with him and fight with him and try to get the best of him. But she said, I don't anymore. She said, but he comes around and starts telling me that stuff. I just say, Jesus, he's out the door. Go see what he wants. <laughs> the only way you can rebuke the devil is be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And... Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might, not yours. Let me tell you something, brethren. If a full-grown African lion came to that door looking for a meal, there isn't anybody in this room that's going to tie a knot in his tail. That lamp is mine, if I can reach it, <laughs> when they come in. Well, you say, well, why did he say resist the devil then? Because he said resist the devil, but he said... Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You resist the devil in God's strength. In God's strength. Knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. That's sometimes, sometimes kind of hard for a Christian to remember. You get going through things and they get tough and you get down the mouth. You think the Lord's against you and giving up and God's all through with you. You get feeling low and you think you're up against things nobody else is up against. 
My Bible tells me there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man, and your brethren that are in the world have the same problems you have. You know, several years ago I went through a very dark valley. At least I thought it was dark. But like I said, you know, hindsight's better than foresight. Don't look too dark from here. But look dark at the time. And I said, Lord, if there's any preacher in this country that's ever been asked to do what I've been asked to do under the condition I've been put under. I said, you just can't ask me to do what you're asking me to do in the, in the circumstance I'm under. And in less than 48 hours, I met two preachers in the same circumstance. Less than 48 hours. If there's anybody in this building that's sick, where I can't go within a hundred miles of this building and find another Christian that's had the same sickness. People say, well, our little old baby is deformed. I know a lot of Christians have deformed babies. I get around all this country, the whole this country. I got a friend up there in, uh, in Indianapolis that had a little old mongloid baby, and that baby was born like it broke his mother and daddy's heart, and the worker came around and talked to the mom and daddy and said, you better take this child and put this child in the home. It'll grow up abnormal and... Uh, you, you, you'll you feel ashamed of it and this and that and, and you better give the child up and let a home take care of it. And that guy and his wife got together and prayed about that thing. They went to the welfare work and the doctor and said, no, we're going to take him home and love him. We're going to do that. They took that little boy home and raised him in the home and one day they brought him to Sunday school and they brought him to Sunday school and came there toddling about four years old, that funny old head, you know, and locking him on the side. Two other people in the church that had mom and babies bought theirs. And then 15... <laughs> And they got a class for mongoloid children back in the Sunday school. Seventeen mongoloid kids back there studying the Bible together. If there's any Christian in this building that's going through something all alone, what you're going through right this minute, there's another Christian going through right this minute. Now, you just don't know where he is. But he's out there. He's out there in Memphis or Jacksonville or out there in Rochester or Greenbury or Cincinnati or Cleveland or Dayton or San Antonio or Fort Worth or Dallas or Greenboro or Raleigh. Or, he's out there. And he said, resist the devil. Fight, 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 fight. God's people, God's people shouldn't lay down and quit. You ought to stand up and fight. Put on the armor. Do battle, brother. Do battle. I was on a rescue mission one time talking with the rescue mission superintendent, and I used to preach to them every year. Me, and brother. You take old Billy Sunday, he used to call him old split foot. Billy used to walk up there and make fun of him and ridicule him and call him old smutty mouth and this and point his finger down and challenge him. I heard Ma Sunday say that all their children die without Christ. Not a one of them was saved. Billy said, come on, devil, take me on. The devil said, I'll take you on. Get your kids. You don't mess with that one. I guess perhaps the only one that ever dealt with him directly and ever half got away was, was, was Martin Luther. And old Martin Luther lived in, in danger of, of, of moral life, of assassin's dagger, 24 hours a day. All right, how does the devil work? He works by counterfeit, camouflage, and compromise. The devil works by counterfeit. The devil's masterpiece is a Bible that looks like a Bible that's not a Bible. The devil's masterpiece is a church that looks like a church that's not a church. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, that old drunk in the gutter, he's not a good advertisement for the devil. He's one of the devil's failures. The devil's, the devil's best advertisement is a nice, rich, moral, intelligent, religious man that's lost. That's a good advertisement for the devil. The devil works by camouflage. He covers himself up where you can't see him. He'll go around and tell you, sister, he'll tell you, you see your husband? He don't love you. He don't care about you. He don't worry about you. He don't listen to you. What if you say goes one in and out the other? No. And they step around to you and say, you see your wife nagging all the time, wasting the money, sitting around doing nothing, gossiping all the time, shooting off her big mouth. Blah, 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 blah. And about the time the two of you get going at each other, he slips out the door laughing. That Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your adversary is not your wife. Your adversary is not your husband. Your adversary is the devil. Your adversary is the devil. Or I find he works by compromise, and that's the greatest way he has to work. I told people in America 20 years ago that they lived to see the time the doctor was rec doctors would recommend beer for babies. And folks used to laugh at me, and I said that, and shake their heads and look at each other and wink. They don't anymore. They don't anymore. Doctors have been doing that for years. You know how compromise works? Here's a big old sign out there in the road that shows a fellow smoking a cigarette, and then about four months later the guy comes out there and puts up the sign, 
and he's smoking the cigarette, and a girl's watching him. About four months later, he got the cigarette in his mouth, and she's lighting it for him. And about four months later, he changed the sign, and he's lighting the cigarette and giving it to her. And about four months later, she got the cigarette in her mouth, and he's lighting it. And about four months later, she got it all by herself, and you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> yes, you have. The wrong way. And every time you get going like that, these dumb educators think we're progressing. You're not progressing, you're degenerating. That isn't tolerating, that isn't becoming tolerant, that is compromise. And to slip and, and slip and slip, you slip off into hell. Let me see if I can illustrate compromise. A fellow gets saved. When he gets saved, he gets reading his Bible. When he reads his Bible, he says this. He says, I believe that hell is a burning place where an unsaved man goes and burns forever and never gets out. Read some more books. I believe hell is a place where people go and burn when they die, but it's probably in literal fire. It's probably something worse. Read a few more books. I believe hell is a place where an unsaved man goes when he dies, but it couldn't be literal fire. It would burn him up. Read a few more books. I believe an unsaved fellow dies, he goes to hell, and he burns, but he couldn't burn forever. I mean, after all, God is good. <laughs> Reads a few more books. I believe a fellow dies and unsaved, he burns for a while, and then pretty soon God annihilates, and that's the end of it. Reads a few more books. I believe an unsaved fellow dies, something happened to him, he don't know what it is. Reads a few more books. I believe when saved folks, unsaved folks die, that probably the same thing happens to them. Reads a few more books. Oh, when you're dead, you're dead like a dog. You know what you call that? You call that education. <laughs> One more time with feeling. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God from cover to cover, including the cover. You read a few books. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God except for the chapter and verse headings and the italics. Read a few more books. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God except for the verse and chapter heading and the italics and a few spurious passages that are not of the oldest manuscripts. Read a few more books. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, but there are other good translations too. Read a few more books. I believe the King James Bible is a good translation, but the best translation is the new ASV. It's truer to the original. Read a few more books. I believe the Bible, the Word of God, is the original, but not a translation. Read a few more books. I believe the original manuscripts of the Word of God, if anybody could find them. Read a few more books. Nobody's ever found them, so we don't know what the Word of God is. Read a few more books. My opinion, just good as yours. You know what they call that? They call that Christian education. <laughs> You see what I mean, Jelly Bean? <laughs> now, you know what that book says? That book says, Find them, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and the power of his might. Take on the whole armor of God, and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore. Stand, brethren. Now, let's take our stand, and let's don't move one quarter of an inch or one half an inch. Stand. In a Roman phalanx in combat, the fellow stand like this with a shield here, and the sword here, and the spearmen in front of them receive the cavalry charge. And when those fellows stand like that and move forward in the phalanx this way, if one man gives place, there's an opening in the ranks. It's kind of like a red dog and a blitz from a, from a linebacker. If one man in the line don't know what he's supposed to do, they're in on you. And when God's people give way and give rank and move and shift, the devil's in. Now you make sure, brother, that you take your stand, don't you move one quarter of an inch. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Now, Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'll raise up some good soldiers here of Jesus Christ in this audience. I know there's some here already. There's some people here who are fighting the good fight of faith. Now, I don't want a church like this that's had the kind of preaching they've had. There are going to be some here that are they've got the armor on, they're fighting the good fight, and if they're taking a licking, at least they're taking for your glory. And some of them are getting some blows in for God, and we thank God for that. Now, give them courage. Give encourage them, Lord. We need, we need some encouragement. We need some morale boosting in our troops, Lord. And Father, for some young man here who hasn't enlisted, I pray he'll he'll sign up tonight and join the right army and come to Jesus Christ as the captain of his salvation and say, now I'm going to take on orders from you. What you say, it's going to be yes, sir, or no, sir, no excuse, sir. Bless me, the heads bowed and eyes closed a few minutes in prayer. Maybe there's some young man in this building tonight and you're saved. But you've never really sold out to Jesus Christ. Never really got on the battlefront. When I was a young man, my daddy taught me there are only three answers to a question. 
Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. When the Lord is telling you to do something and giving you a commandment, you can only answer one of three ways. Yes, sir. No, sir. Or no excuse, sir. There's no excuse. Now, I don't know where you are, young fellow. I don't know who I'm talking to. But while we're in prayer, I know I'm talking to somebody. And young fellow, there's only one army that's going to win in the end. That's the Lord's army. And there's only one fight worth fighting anymore. You fight for the United States anymore, you don't know whether you're fighting for Rockefeller, the Illuminati, or the international bankers, or the Federal Reserve System. You fight for Germany anymore, you don't know whether you're fighting for the communists or the fascists. There's only one commander worth fighting for and dying for, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you haven't enlisted, you ought to enlist today, tonight. I'll still be in prayer a few minutes. In a minute, we're going to stand and sing. When we stand and sing, I want to give an invitation especially to the men here tonight. I know maybe you women have some problems too, and maybe need some encouragement and some some iron in your system. And I, I'm I'm interested in the men tonight. And there's a man here tonight who's been faint-hearted and fallen by the wayside, and ready to quit, and demoralized, and the devil got you down. I want you to come tonight. Put your sword out in the altar again and your shield down there and get them consecrated again and anointed with oil and go out that door to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. <clears throat> and brothers, you have to start over afresh from the bottom and start all over again. Do it again. I've had to start three times. I've had to start three times from nothing, man, since I was 18 years old. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Now, God help you. God help you. Father, undertake for us tonight. Give us some stalwart Christians here who will stand for something and won't give ground and won't compromise and will fight the good fight of faith and endure the heart and us a good soldier, Jesus Christ. Give us some young men who can take a beating for God's glory. Give us some young men who can put up with difficulty and, and, and temperature and sickness and persecution and long marches and sore feet and sore shoulders and deprivation and bad food and no sleep, and everything that comes with it in the army of the Lord, and do it for your glory. And get awarded at the great pass and view someday, and get the medal they've earned. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Lackey, as the Lord leads me.